pants, my my ass. I'm on my floor. Bonjour, Monsieur Pussycat. Cracking toast, poet. Start uh, spreading the uh, news. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the short podcast about short films. I'm your host, and we are discussing the Academy Award for Best Animated Short. Today's episode is about the 50th year of the award. 5-0. We made it so far at the 54th Academy Awards, which celebrates the films of 1981. Today's guest is a good friend of mine previously talking about Nighty Night Bugs and the nominees of 1958. Please welcome Madeline Moss. Hello, Madeline. Yay. Hello. I'm back. You're back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> welcome back. We're, we're so happy to have you again. Yay. And I'm unfortun- happy to be here. And unfortunately, we don't have Bugs Bunny to welcome you this time. And no That's Paul- okay. No Paul Bunyan and no former voices from Courage the Cowardly Dog. <laughs> I mean, that short was still really bad. <laughs> it was awful. Yeah, like we look, we we do have a better. Li- I'll, I'll say that much. I I I'll spoil that much. We do have a better lineup this year than that year. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, but yeah, uh, before we get into everything, though, uh, just remind us, what is your familiarity with the best animated short category? Um, not much, but um, I'm trying to, um, as I get more into just Oscars history and stuff, I, um, I always try to, you know, seek these out. But um, unfortunately, I am a uh, I am biased towards features <laughs> like uh sad pleb nubian like <laughs> most people <laughs> yeah so 99 um, of film go yeah yeah so but you know i still i still if i ever see and they usually do have you know a showcase every year that i want to go to it's just finding the time to go with when you know they're uh happening but yeah i mean i um i mostly if it, if anything i'm more into it um when and this is sad because they they do have a grip on the uh category i feel like a lot of the times but i usually was familiar uh more familiar with this category when you know there's like a disney or pixar short uh nominated course. that played before like you know a pick disney movie mm-hmm yeah it, it's the story for everyone it's just like you don't really care about the category but you know like the pixar shorts that air before some of their features or maybe just watch one of them on disney plus or whatever and it's just yeah, like, yeah. but there's it, some i i really really liked like i i watched more uh from last year than i did like almost ever <laughs> honestly did you go to like one of the screenings or did you just like watch them on, on youtube or something no, I just watched them at home and I I really liked uh My Year of Dicks just mm-hmm. because it was uh, relatable. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I remember after I went to the short screening, I texted you or I messaged you yeah. just like, hey, you need to watch this. You'll love it. And I specifically Yeah, and I did. <laughs> yes. And it was specifically it was first specifically because of the Sailor Moon esque sequence, but <laughs> Because you're yeah. you're a Sailor Moon fan. But then also there's oh, yeah. just like a lot of it's just a very I don't even know how to put this, but it, it's just a relatable movie. Especially if you um if you have like, you know, if you date people. Yeah. If you date then, men. Uh it it got robbed very hard. I fucking hate it. Oh here. yeah. <laughs> and, and, I I whenever I remember that the fucking boy mole fox horse one is just like I I feel this rage inside me, uh, and it's just it's... like <laughs> what I, I, I talk about this uh, not so to much. Kabir completely off course, but but like what's with the academy suddenly being like we're gonna pick the most smarmy like emotionally devastating shorts, but not the good ones. <laughs> 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 it, it's just like and the thing about the boy of the mobile fox the horse it's just like they 
these kind of like 30 minute british uh like tv specials they get nominated all the fucking time they're like based on storybooks or whatever they get nominated all the fucking time but rarely do they ever win as it's just like shit like robin robin and like fucking uh, revolting rhymes and, and uh fucking room on the broom things like that uh, it's just like they get nominated a bunch but they never win they're just category filler <laughs> and so why the fuck did this one win it, it's <laughs> worth in all of them <laughs> it's one of the worst fucking nominees in this category's history i fucking hate <laughs> that shit yeah they've been on a pretty bad uh shorts streak i feel like uh yeah. like animate and animated shorts usually like all right but like yeah these past three years have been like they they're literally like the the three winners of the past three years are at the bottom of my list in terms of like all the nominees <laughs> from the 2020s. Like they are the bottom three. Exactly. Oh my God. Dead. That's so funny. <laughs> they, they just have a vendetta against you. They were just like, we're going to pick all the ones you hate. <laughs> you know, it is this like new decade, new me. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the 2010s were so good for the category. There's just so many good shorts in there. And so many of the winners the are really, one, really good. The only one I remember causing a lot of issues was when Edge of Tomorrow. Uh, or World of Tomorrow. I almost said Edge of Tomorrow. Oh my God. World of Tomorrow. <laughs> well, uh, lost, lost to the fucking Bear Story, which, yeah, yeah. It was one of the lesser winners. There's, but it's still bears. not. Like... Bears. Bears. Uh, bears. <laughs> but yeah, it's just. Still, like the 2010s, they're a great time for the category, but you know, yeah, I agree. But we're not in the 2010s now, are we? We are no, in we're 1981, in and it Woo. is, and we, you know, it's Reagan's president. We're all having a terrible time, Boo. and so <laughs> let, let's just let's just kick back with some short films. Let's get into these nominees we have, uh, and the year has only yeah. three. Our first nominee and the year's winner is Crack, directed by Frederick Bach. A uh, quick note, while there is some different stylizing use for the title of this film, I want you to imagine that every time I say this film's title, it ends with an exclamation point. Not just because that's how <laughs> Frederick Bach always writes it, but also because I think it's more fun that way. Crack! Uh, this is the first Oscar win and second nomination for Beck after last year's nominee, All Nothing. Uh, I left off last year giving a brief overview to who Fed Rip Beck was, talking about his many artistic pursuits and his art environmental activism and his labyrinthian autobiography from his now defunct website. So let, let's just now this year, we're going to go over a few of his prior films that led up to Crack. And all of his work features themes related to his environmentalism. And there are two kinds of back films in this early period we're talking about. There's the children, there's, as I call them, the children films and the indigenous films. The children films, which starts with Abracadabra in 1970 and continues with Illusion in 75 and then Terra Tara in 1976. These are all films about children fighting evil forces to take back the environment, with Abracadabra featuring the kids taking back the sun after it's stolen, and Illusion featuring a magician who turns nature into a dystopian urban landscape, and Terra Tata, as Bach describes it, is about denouncing the term progress and how it is used to destroy nature and culture. And then there's the indigenous films, which take their plots from indigenous beliefs and legends that impart the importance of animals and nature, such as the, cre the creation of birds, discussing the changing of the seasons, and Inon being a story about how animals stole fire from the titular god of thunder to give to humanity. And after this, we get the previously discussed All Nothing, and now the film we discussed today, Crack. Uh, next time Bat comes up, we will discuss more about his personal life. But for now, what is Crack all about? Crack starts with a man chopping down the tree, thus giving us the titular Crack. And from there, we see more than 100 years through the life of the rocking chair made from that tree. Madeline, start us off. What did you think of Crack? Crack, crack is a cute uh, and very beautifully animated short. Um, I like that the wooden walking chair has a smiley face on it. <laughs> it, it does, like right on the little bar. It is, yes, this is a very... 
I, I thought it was a very fun short. Like you got this these different musical pieces throughout it, and all of them are just so uh, so either so beautifully com- composed or they're just really fun to listen to. And it's just like when there's like the dance scenes and whatever, or, and the way the way it's all <laughs> and I made it. <laughs> you're excused. Uh, Sorry, but you're, you're fine. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just so beautiful the, the way it's all animated, and it's just like the way it shows you. It, it's not really telling a story here. It it's not. You're not supposed to really follow a plot. At least I didn't see it that way. It, it's really just showing you all these different moments from time, right? and it's, and sure, I I understand how that can be kind of like boring i guess it's just like you you're just kind of watching it feeling like what what's even happening here what am i supposed to see or or whatever but it's just like just go with it you know just go go with the flow it's like feel the vibes you know just i like... think the the ending is really uh like good payoff too because it it should it the chair vibes with a bunch of other stuff that has history and I think that's kind of neat. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's like it, the film starts out with like, you know, this kind of rural landscape. It's like people live in a cabin or whatever. And it gets eventually it becomes like, you know, it, the kind of thing we that I at least have seen in some of Frederick Back's other films, how it's like an urban dystopia and stuff. Of, but then it's just like we end up at the this art museum and the chair gets saved from the dump. It becomes a piece of art and, and lives in the museum. And it's just like it's and then he's just partying with all the other paintings. <laughs> it's just like it's it's fun. really cute it's, because it, it's I think it's belongs. Yeah, and then it I don't know, it's like uh, this might sound like reaching, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, the I don't know. I interpreted it as like you know, like everything has like a story behind it. So like you know, have fun with it. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> they're they're all just vibing to it, the, the painting, exactly. the chair. They're just like we love that we have cool backstories. And, <laughs> You know, and we learn from each other and then the security card comes in is like hmm weird but then like they're still vibing this, this is the night at the museum movie that i want yeah exactly it's like artsy night at the museum with the yeah honestly over. we we should get like they should do like night at the art museum like i feel like that would be a really interesting movie it, it'd be like that one you know that yeah, one scene just... from uh, Looney Tunes back in action that gets posted all the time, uh, where it's just like they're fighting yeah, for the art yeah, museum. Yeah. It'd be like that, <laughs> except it's the whole the movie. Part of Looney Tunes back in action. <laughs> it, it's the one part of Looney Tunes back in action. <laughs> well, like, okay, not to veer into Looney Tunes back in action. Defense, Go ahead, defense mode, please. But like. But like you know, I feel like that scene, at least Joe Dante was allowed to, you know, actually indulge into what the Looney Tunes are about. So, um, but I agree with uh, with Patrick when he says uh, that they feel like side characters in a movie that's about them. And I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. unfortunately, it's better than Space Jam, though. Sorry to Space Jam apologists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I am not a Space Jam apologist. <laughs> I think Space Jam is fun. I haven't seen Looney Tunes back in action. It but... has it has some good memes though in uh, Space Jam. <laughs> F- fucking flat oh Wayne Knight. <laughs> or even like the sequel of I slam my pe- <laughs> I slam my I slam my penis in a car door. <laughs> That's iconic. Um, oh, but, but yeah. The- the chairs the chair had like you know it's there's a letterbox list that says like don't it says something like don't think about it just feel it or something like that like this is a short that's definitely like that where it's just like you know mr back was literally like hey things stuff has history and they go through a lot as well and it's not and maybe we shouldn't just consider it all trash. Maybe he liked thrift shopping a lot, probably. <laughs> um, 
but <laughs> but you know it, it was really sweet like at first I wasn't so sure as much as I like the animation and the music because I was like well where is this going but then when the ending comes I was like oh that's really sweet I like that so I can see why this one because it had um shout out to the composer uh who I just looked up uh Norman Roger who apparently composes a lot of music for uh Frederick Bax stuff so mm -hmm. cool cool on them uh keep up the good work even though uh you're both of them are probably not alive anymore <laughs> oh yeah I, I know Frederick Bax is dead I, I don't know about this composer guy yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. uh but yeah it is I was thinking trying to think about it like how this film plays into like Frederick Bach's uh, environmentalism stuff because like like as as I mentioned it's like all of his fucking movies are about his environmentalism he he can't shut up about it uh and I was thinking like based. how <laughs> yeah it's true it, it's based it, it, like yes environmentalism is <laughs> cool but also it's just like you know everything he does is about it which is which is fine but I'm just trying to think like how does this play into it and I'm thinking like a lot of the film is just about how this chair can kind of go like unappreciated, unnoticed, and especially like in, towards like as we get closer to the ending of the film where like we see yeah. it, you like get throw literally thrown out into the snow as the land is getting sold away. Hey, and then and it ends up in the dump, as we said. And then I'm thinking like the film starts with a man going into nature and chopping down a tree. And it's just like the, and from then on, it's trying to find, it's the chair itself, I guess, kind of trying to find the place where it belongs. And it's like it doesn't belong with people. It doesn't belong in the city. It doesn't, it, but it does belong in this art museum with other things that are made of paper, made of trees. Is like may, maybe that's yeah. a bit of a stretch, but also I well feel like that might be something. It, it's also like a place where it can finally be appreciated for being beautiful. There's two. Yeah. It's just like it's not yeah, a, it's, a utility. It's not just seen as stuff mm -hmm. to to buy and use. It's it's a thing to be appreciated. And it's kind of neat because going off of the environmental stuff, like maybe he me maybe he makes a good point of like you know, we carve these things from nature and we should appreciate nature and, and all the gifts it can give us. Uh, I know that sounds very philosophical deep, but, you know, like, yeah, it's it. it this is a little chair that has a smiley face. He's I like a little face on it. Yeah, he's cute. He's, he's a cute little chair. He's cute. And um, I and I guess it's the history of Quebec too, but I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not up on Canadian history. Sorry, I'm American. <laughs> yeah, I, I I am not Quebecois. I don't know any like subtle references to the history of, of Quebec and Eastern Neither. Canada, uh, French Sorry, Canada. Uh, don't don't apologize to the Quebecois. They don't deserve it. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, no, it's pretty funny. <laughs> But like, it's a, it's a, I don't know. It, I feel like it's a short that, like, you know, like I said, I at first I was like, where the hell is this going? But then, when it comes to it, it's just like, oh, that was really sweet. Um, and so I really appreciate that from coming from this short. Um, makes me knowing that he's a an environmental uh guy makes me wanna check out more of his stuff because um. You know, I agree about, you know, we got to keep the environment cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and not I, pump fossil fuels and shit. You you should probably check out uh, The Man Who Planted Trees. Uh, that's that's his most famous short. I think it's on yeah. that it's on that list of like the top 50 animated short films as ranked by animators or whatever it's called. Hold as just oh like, cool. It it also won this category. It's it's a pretty if you're into animated short films, it's a pretty notable animated short film. And, and it's like I, I've never I've never uh I've never considered myself somebody not into animated short films, but I guess I just never like you know 
went out to seek them unless it was like a Looney Tunes <laughs> short or like a or like, like a Tom and Jerry short. You know, mostly like well, well now's your the chance. Golden Age cartoons and stuff. Yeah, now's yeah. my chance. I can watch the man who planted trees yeah. and um and all his other stuff like the mighty river and uh all nothing and illusion and stuff <laughs> i i can see you going through the uh, letterbox page <laughs> yeah by popularity too <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and abracadabra Therefore, the creation the of birds stuff. terra tat uh, in order conquest of fire yeah the second 22nd annual yeah. animation show of shows and that's it did he did did he like uh did he like the Lorax a lot? Because I could see him liking the Lorax a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, you seriously. Know, you know, I, I, I don't know. I didn't see it in his autobiography biography anywhere. Uh, it, I, I, I wonder... feel like he would have been into the Lorax, not 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 the twenty twelve monstrosity, <laughs> like the the one by uh the one from the seventies that is really good, and I uh constantly really champion and i'm like underrated you guys and nobody wants to listen to me you know i the, the fact that you mentioned the 2012 movie made me want to re look up again when he died just to find out like if he could have seen that because he died around that time but i'm not sure and it turns out that he died at the end of 2013 so he definitely could have seen no <laughs> he was there oh no <laughs> Oh god, he was there for the one slur fandom. <laughs> <laughs> he was I'm alive. Just, I'm just imagining like he he was secretly on Tumblr that <laughs> and he was and he's like, no, care about the tree. This is not what the Lorax is about. He what if the Lorax was secretly based off of him? <laughs> he was like, I'm I'm the truffula tree guy. <laughs> no, it, what, what happened? It was that he based himself on the Lorax. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, he he read the but... Lorax when it first came out, and it was like, damn, I want to be like him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which based? I like the, I like that little guy, even when he's voiced by Danny DeVito, who is it's an inspired choice, but the writing is bad. Sorry, mm -hmm. not to go off on the 2012 Lorax movie. <laughs> we, we can't help but go on tangents. But yeah. But yes, yeah. Uh, Danny DeVito would have been a good Lorax in a better movie. Yes. Da 100%. Danny DeVito just needs. I, I feel like he's become too much of a joke. And like, we need to really appreciate him as an actor again because he is a great he needs, actor. like a dramatic role or something like that. Like, he needs like a really good dramatic role. Like I, I think of him in the same light as I think of Wallace Shawn, and Wallace Shawn has like a lot. He really goes into like the theater scene. He's a very prominent writer and actor. Whereas it's right, like, I, right. I need to give Danny DeVito his own Vanya on Forty Second Street or My Dinner with Andre. <laughs> I, I think he would really excel. Like, like we need to get throw him back in time and uh, get Louis Mal to direct something from him. I think. No, if... no, wait. What about like? Oh, uh, uh, my dinner with Andre, but with, with Danny DeVito. <laughs> Just like a my dinner with Andre movie with Danny DeVito. <laughs> Uh, I, I thought you were going to say someone else. It's just like, just Danny DeVito. And, and who? who Who's going to be the Andre? Um, hmm. Who would he play off well with in a, Richard a kind. setting like that? Okay, I agree. Let's do Richard Kind and Danny DeVito in a similar type movie like My Dinner with Andre. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he could do it, honestly. Like... I I believe in Danny DeVito's uh, act ability. I believe in uh, Danny DeVito's completely. supremacy. Exactly, uh, mm -hmm. Danny DeVito. <laughs> I, I support our short kings. Yeah, exactly. N now I want to know how tall Frederick Buck was. We love them. I, I just like I, I love that smiley chair in crack. <laughs> exactly. Bring it back. Bring it back. Like I'm figuring out how tall he was. You're figuring. You're talking about the chair again. It's, it's all coming back. Uh, I, I, I can't. I can't find anything about his actual height. However, the park that's named after him has an elevation like gain, like from uh, or I guess from 
base to top is 101 feet. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, if you're, yeah, wow, if, okay. If you're in the area, go go take a walk in Frederick Back Park. Will do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I think that's that a good place cool. to move on. Uh, unless you have anything else yeah, to add. <laughs> no, it's just a good a good short. I good, like it. <laughs> cute, fun, short. That's beautifully, beautifully yeah. animated. Has beautiful, beautiful yeah. music. And it, it helps you appreciate yeah. art. It's about art. I guess. Yeah. Maybe. It's about a lot of things. Well, appreciating creation. Appreciating Mm -hmm. creation, I think. And speaking of creation, our second nominee is The Creation, directed by Will Vinton. Can I say say say? something really quickly before we start on this one? The So the letterbox description for The Creation says, narrated by James Earl Jones, but it has an exclamation point at the end. So it's like animated short that was nominated for an Oscar. Narrated by James Earl Jones. Jones. <laughs> that, that, that just gives me the vibes of like the you know the the Star Wars holiday special. It had on the, the YouTube upload has yeah. those fake credits at the beginning of it. <laughs> and it's just like has the fake Star Wars scroll that's not actually the original thing. It's just like and Carrie Fisher I sings. Love that you know that. I I have seen the Star Wars holiday special in theaters five times. It is amazing. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure you like the Star Wars holiday special more than other most other Star Wars properties. I do. It is a blast. <laughs> and the Arthur should be recognized in canon. Very I Very true. I was thinking about the song that she sings briefly recently, he, and I'm just thinking, if I were ever given the opportunity to direct a Star Wars property, I would try and cram as many references of to the Star Wars holiday <laughs> special as I can into that. And one of the ideas I had was ha- having like this fucking uh, like cabar- cabaret style thing going on. Like maybe it's another cantina, <laughs> except they have you know like a stage show there because why wouldn't they? They, right, right, they right. need entertainment. Why wouldn't? And, yeah. And it's just like a space version of a drag queen doing B. Arthur's number because the thing about her segment <laughs> in the Star Wars Holiday Special is that it's this fucking like empire funded PSA about like how shitty life is on Tatooine or whatever. Or and it's just like oh my god. And it's just like they show it out, be like, "Look at the scum of the earth." But I, I'm thinking like there are fucking people who would watch that and be like, "Yo, that's actually fucking cool." Fuck the government, <laughs> fuck the empire. Uh, we're actually gonna turn this song into our fucking anthem. And it's like it's gonna become a like a fucking coll- like a standard. Like they take it back. <laughs> they take it back. Exactly. They take back the Arthur. Um, <laughs> the B Arthur strikes back. I'm, ima- I'm imagining the cat claw but in Star Wars. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You, you know, I want a Weimar era cabaret in Star Wars. I think that could actually look really cool. Uh, Kathleen Kennedy, call us. <laughs> <laughs> the creation is Will Vinton's third nomination after winning for Close Mondays and being nominated for Whip Rip Van Winkle. <laughs> the thing about the career of Will Vinton is that while he gets these Oscar nominations all within this short period of time, his last Oscar nation, his final Oscar nomination coming up next year is still before he does anything that he is the most famous for. I, I really want to say the words the California Raisins on this podcast, but Vinton's weird <laughs> career tra- trajectory doesn't let me until we start talking about his post-Oscar career, which is absolutely bonkers. Uh, but for now, <laughs> all he's done between his last nomination and this one is make two other short films, Legacy and Dinosaur. Anyway, the creation is about, well, the creation. James Earl Jones narrates the creation of our world through the words of James Eldon Johnson poem of the same name. Uh, I th- This short is, again, just like the last one, it's a very kind of simple short. It, but the thing about it is it has great animation. It has great fucking music. And that James Earl fucking Jones narration is, is so insane. It's amazing. He, I, I don't know who told him to go that hard but i want to thank them uh because 
he didn't have to go that hard, but he did. And just, you know what? James Earl Jones, just a, a national treasure. We we love him. I, or I love him, at least. I think James Earl Jones is just a pious man. And when he's talking about God, when he's talking about the things God has done for us, he can't help but be passionate about it. <laughs> it's like... It's like I haven't been Catholic for a long time, but maybe he can convince me again. <laughs> <laughs> James Earl Jones would be a good cult leader. Like he he has the voice for it. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> real. <laughs> Unfortunately, real. But, but yeah, th- this is just like it's a very straightforward short. It, it tells the story of creation as it was told in the Bible from God. From, from when there was nothing to God creating light and the land and sea and eventually he makes man and all is good and, and that's it. It's just a very typical kind of thing. But the thing about it is it just elevates it so much, for me at least. Yeah, yeah. It's um because it's already really pretty like to look at. But <laughs> then you hear like James Earl Jones just like giving it all in that recording studio and you're just like, whoa. Yeah. Uh-oh. The the paintings look almost it's like I don't know what the style is like. I, I'm not good at art terms as much as I want to be, but I will just if you Google the creation 1981, you can see some frames and they are very nice. Yeah, it, it's like cool stuff. I guess well, like maybe it'd be called like impressionistic kind of like kinda, I'm not entirely sure yeah. like but the thing, the thing about it is, it's like this is so different from like other Will Vinton kind of things because he usually, you know, makes like the three D clay models, claymation, and all that, and it's like they're walking around or whatever. But this isn't that. It, it's just a like I'm, I'm not even sure if this is clay that he's making this with because it might, I, be, but it might not be. It might. But- yeah, I would imagine it, it would be because it's Will Vinton, but also it might not be because like it doesn't yeah, it, really it looks, look likely. It looks like he just painted it a bunch. And there's a picture on IMDb of Joan Gratz, so, who I guess is like an animator on this. It looks like she is painting yeah. um, the frames and such. So cool. <laughs> and yeah, Joan Gratz is really fucking cool too. Who uh yeah, I just want to say that she comes up in this category later or for a different short Mona Lisa descending a staircase. And, and this is oh, very similar to that in terms of its style. So, oh, yeah, maybe I looked, that makes I sense. The photos. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like her style. Maybe I should buy something at, like if she has prints or something <laughs> or, you know, if she's not alive, she's not alive. If she's not alive anymore. Jesus, I can't say that. Um, then somebody should you know give it to her estate and i will buy this stuff she but, is still alive um, she's 82 years old oh she she's an old lady kicking it cool <laughs> but yeah it's it's cool to it's a cool um you know uh oh so kind of, i just figured it yeah. out it is clay it's clay painted oh <laughs> that you can paint with oh, clay oh what that's really cool <laughs> Yeah. It, oh wow, that's that's real neat. Yeah. So I could just I'm just reading from uh Wikipedia here. Uh, clay painting animation is an animation where clay is placed and flattened on a flat supporting surface and moved like wet in quotes oil paints as on traditional artistic canvas oh, to produce wow, any style of images, really cool. but with the clay look to them, filmed frame by frame ah. by an animation camera after each small adjust- adjustment of the clay images. Um shit uh this is okay so not to talk about rankings already but i always but now i'm kind of contemplating like how i rank these because uh it sounds like the creation was a lot of work (laughs) yeah (laughs) animation is a lot of work (laughs) well yeah yeah yeah. but like you know especially the short seems like a lot of work for just for you know a little nine minute short that was awesome so uh <laughs> it and um yeah it's it's really it i think the exclamation point of narrated by james earl jones is deserved <laughs> yes. he he does give that uh effect to it 
Yeah, somebody somebody on Letterbox on the most popular view says it would have been more interesting if he had done the Darth Vader voice, which maybe, but he still sounds cool and he's really like putting all his uh giving one hundred and twenty percent. Yeah, his his yes, his James Earl Jones Zussy into it. James yeah. Earl Jussie. <laughs> just Jussie. Jussie. Jones Zussy. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think it's James Earl Jesse. I think that's the one that works. Will Vin- Vintussy. <laughs> <laughs> Will Vintussy. No, it's just the Will Vin- Vagina at that point. <laughs> Real good. Will Vintussy. Um, <laughs> but I, because, it, yeah, on, on the surface. The, the Will really as Vussy. Really <laughs> that's. <laughs> Um, it's literally just a biblical, you know, it's, it's Noah's, it's, it goes through Noah's Ark and creation, you know, creation. Not, not Noah's Ark. Like, you don't get there yet. <laughs> That's oh, just before oh, that. Okay. I'm seeing the animals and I literally just put it together for some reason in my dumb brain, brain poisoned brain. <laughs> yeah. First is Genesis. Then we go through Adam and Eve and all of that. I'm a bad, and, and I'm a bad then Catholic. we get to Noah's Ark. Yeah. It's just I'm like a bad, bad Catholic. <laughs> I didn't pay attention in catechism. I was eight. <laughs> <laughs> but I, also I just... wanted to go home and watch cartoons. <laughs> and I just want to say, like, how this is very. Uh... So, Will Vinton also made another movie called The Adventures of Mark Twain, and that this is oh. fe- one feature film, film, and in it, uh, it, it tells this. It tells a lot of different Mark Twain stories, and one of them is like I think Mark Twain wrote like the Diaries of Adam and Eve or something like that. And this that's an animated segment of the film, The Adventures of Mark Twain. And it's just kind of interesting seeing like this version of like the whole creation story versus that version of you know Adam and Eve and all that that part yeah, of the creation yeah. because it's just like like the Adam and Eve segments in that movie. It, it's just like. Like, oh, man is so annoying. It's just like, this woman keeps telling me what to do. It, it, it sounds stupid. <laughs> it, it is kind of stupid. But it, it's a bit better than how I'm making it sound. But also, it it's not as kind of poetic, I guess, as this is. Which makes sense that this is poetic because it's literally based off a poem. James Earl Jones is literally reading out a poem about creation. Yeah, <laughs> putting his old, his old jissy into it. Exactly. <laughs> And um yeah, good short. Good uh, short. Really cool. Love yeah, and the cool, Bible. Cool style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I you know, I really should have researched more about Joan C. Gratz because I feel like she must have been like the main force behind this one, considering yeah. like this this is her whole style. And it's just like yeah. in yeah. like she also worked on the previous nominee, uh, Rip Van Winkle, but uh, thinking back to that one, it's just like the clay painting in that one is like a more minor part of it. it like there is still the classic like uh, Wilvington like clay models and things like that. But this one is all clay painting, and I, that that makes me think that this is mainly Joan. And so yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I, it appears. So I just want to issue a formal apology to Miss Gratz. I'm sorry I didn't do enough research into you for this project because I feel like you deserved more. And maybe I'll do a special episode on you later after uh, after we finish the whole best animated short thing. Or, well, actually, I'm going to talk about you later. You you won a fucking Oscar in this category. We'll we'll yeah. we'll, we'll get to you. <laughs> we'll get to her. So well, don't we'll don't worry, Miss Gratz. I, I just realized. <laughs> We we will talk. We'll get to you, Queen. But yeah, but still, I, I I guess we're talking about her now. But we'll we'll really dive into her life and career later. But yeah, well, I I love her already. Cool cool style. Uh, mad respect. Yeah. Hey, so we're we're building up a watch list for you now. It's like we got man who planted trees, and we got uh, Mona Lisa descending a staircase. It's just like what what else are we going to recommend you watch? I know. I wonder. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll see. Uh, but uh, do you have anything else you'd like to say about the creation? 
Uh, no, other other than it's really cool. <laughs> uh, I I can't think of a fun segue to bridge the fucking creation. Are there to... penguins? Are there penguins in uh in the creation? I didn't see. I any. don't think there were. But our third and okay, final but nominee, anyway, regardless, is the tender tale of Cinderella Penguin, directed by Janet Perlman. This is Janet's first and only nomination in this category, though the short was produced by the National Film Board of Canada, making this their 17th nomination, their first one since their three-year winning streak. Uh, Perlman started directing films for NFB in 1976 uh, with Lady Fishbourne's Complete Guide to Table Manners, and it is while working at NFB that she meets her husband and frequent collaborator, Derek Lamb, who ran the animation division during the late 70s and early 80s. Perlman is most famous for her various penguin films that take classic sco- classic stories and interpret them as if they starred penguins. With this being her most famous work, though she also made Penguins Behind Bars, with both works being adapted into picture books and making two other books as well, The Penguin and the Pea and The Emperor Penguin's New Clothes. But of course, Perlman is much more than penguins. Also with NFB, she made several short films for their series called Showpiece, all talking about conflict resolution. And to this day, Perlman still makes films. This year, she has a film releasing called The Girl with the Red Beret, also produced by NFB. So keep an eye out for that one this Oscar season. Keep up the good work, Janet. But back to today's nominee, The Tender Tale of Cinderella Penguin is the story of Cinderella. Except if she and everyone else were a penguin, that's it. It's just Cinderella, except she's a penguin. Madeline, what did you think of our final nominee? It's fine. (laughs) That's the perfect description. It's fine. It's It's fine. I'd, I'd even dare to say it's good. It is the Cinderella story. And there's some nice, cute moments in there. I mean, Uh, I like penguins. (laughs) I, there's some parts of it that I thought were were kind of inventive. Like I like the part how, like you know, the famous uh, scene where it's like the guards take the shoe to Cinderella's house, and it's just like, but the stepsisters don't want her to try on the shoe. Uh, but it's they put her in a trap, like I guess a basement door or whatever. They close the door on her, but her foot gets caught in the door, and so so it's just hanging out there. And so when the stepsisters are fighting over the shoe, they toss it and it lands on her penguin flipper. Her and it's like it fits. She's still just yeah. underneath there with her foot shaking around. <laughs> then, then then they open yep. the door and find her there. It's like, oh, it's you. Happily it's you. Her. There she is. Yeah. It's me. Um it's me. <laughs> um and and yeah, I mean, it's 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 pe- it's Cinderella with penguins. It um, is Cinderella with penguins. I, di- I did think it was kind of weird how um why is her fairy godmother so fucking small? <laughs> <laughs> That's the fairy. I was I was literally like, they're usually like, you know, human-esque just fairies, you know? Mm-hmm. But like yeah, they, they are usually she's human-sized. so fucking tiny in in this that I was like um okay and uh and then when i wrote my letterbox review of is uh you know usually in every cinderella movie i've seen they turn like you know the mice or the pet dog pet cat or whatever like you know all the animals that cinderella like hangs out with because she's uh, a loner because she's, a she's with being no friends verbally- no no one no one care about her uh, <laughs> um because she's getting verbally and physically abused by uh her step family but um you know usually they'll turn like all that all those little creatures into like you know the horses or the coachman but here they just are like it's a piece of cheese that's going to be the coachman and I'm like how how this woman this little woman penguin fairy godmother turned uh, a piece of cheese into a coachman no idea but this has penguins and but this is penguins as cinderella so who cares and i like that the last slipper is a a a flipper (laughs) i think that's kind of cute uh that she loses a flipper and that's what they're (laughs) it's not like (laughs) a glass shoe it's literally a swimming flipper (laughs) yeah it's it's a flipper with a heel (laughs) 
yeah it's <laughs> it's kind of funny um i i i don't know it's it's really cute um it's not that it doesn't really you know do anything that different from other other um cinderella adaptations it's literally all the basic stuff you know she mm-hmm. uh her step family sucks she wants to go to the ball they're like haha bitch why would you ever go to the ball and then they leave without her and then she's like uh i want to go to the ball and then the fairy godmother's like cool but cu- i'll let you go here's a dress and here's your here's your coach but back before midnight and they're like okay and then she meets the prince and they have a grand old time but then it's midnight and then she has to leave and then you know the rest you know she loses the shoe they find they find her put on the shoe and then they get married the end like it doesn't do anything fundamentally different at all um but if you like penguins, uh, it could be a cute watch. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just like the only thing it does different is the fact that no one's ever thought to make everything penguins before. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then, um, I mean, uh, I have a it's cousin. It's like even, her husband... even the horses that roll right leave yeah. the carriage are penguins. Yeah. They're just penguins yeah, on all you... fours. The fa- my favorite part of the letter uh, of the letterbox description of it, it's like even the mice become the quote unquote horses, <laughs> mm-hmm. like the horses are in quotes, and it's like yeah, because they're penguins. They're actually horses. penguins. Yeah, it's like uh, uh, they're, they're just penguins that are pretending to be horses. It's like the penguin version yeah. of horses or whatever. I am in, in speaking of Janet Pearl's penguin stuff because you mentioned her penguin penguins behind bars. Now that's something I'm interested in just because that sounds like a funny concept mm-hmm. to satirize uh like you know the women in prison movies of like the 70s and stuff mm-hmm. <laughs> but with penguins cuz that 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 at least seems a little, you know, absurd. You know what I mean? That I that I get yeah. like the joke behind it, and, and apparently it was an Adult Swim special. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, and uh, those who know me know I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm very brain poisoned by Adult Swim in a young age. So of course I find everything, uh, or maybe not everything, but a lot of things of uh, on on you know the channel and the block to be hilarious it's, it's okay get so, it out <laughs> yeah i'm just like how am out. i trying to how am i trying to phrase this i don't even know um so but yeah penguins behind bars uh that's something i'm gonna find for myself because that looks that seems pretty funny okay uh, man because... who planted trees mona lisa sending a staircase and penguins behind bars and penguins behind bars yeah yeah everything from these people uh that are behind all these winners but yeah it's i mean it's cute and the sad thing is is that the this was put up against two shorts that are pretty you know uh i don't want to call them interesting mature, but <laughs> yeah they, they take more risks honestly yeah. <laughs> so and, uh, um it, it's just yeah. part kind of like the animation here isn't all that special like it it, it it's fine it looks it's okay good. It, it's the style that they're going for but it's just not yeah. like it, it's not experimental or anything which it doesn't need to be but also it, it, it's it's nice to see sometimes yeah yeah it's 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 you like you could probably like show this to children and they'd get a kick out of it um it's it's because, like compar- you know it's 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 like comparing it's Bob's Burgers, the movie, to like Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio or something like that. Yeah, that seems like yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Or like, um, what's another nation I find just okay? Or like, or maybe it's not trying to be more than it actually is. Maybe that is a good analogy. Super um, Mario versus Across the Spider Verse. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's about right and i don't even really like that super mario brothers movie but i also um understand why people do and it is what it is um Mm -hmm. and you know it's 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 kind of neat that it's a you know a female directed short usually um short animated shorts and um 
documentaries are where you're going to find the most, I feel like you're going to find the most female directors in mm-hmm. the Oscars categories, at least. I'm, I'm trying to doc- think. Yeah, yeah, I think documentary short, documentary feature and documentary short both have a lot of uh, yeah. female winners. Uh, animation yeah, and less I feel so, like- but yeah. I feel like more women have background in animated shorts, though, rather than like feature. It's only now where I feel like they're actually starting to, you know, take the helms in a lot of big, uh, big projects for uh, animated features, like with um, with uh, Turning Red and stuff like that, Um, which uh, finally, (laughs) what the hell, you guys, besides like. I think the Kung Fu Panda movie maybe were like the second one was directed by a lady and the third one co-directed by yeah yeah Jennifer U. Nelson mm-hmm. um so kind of cool to have this happen so early even if it's just a cute little you know Cinderella but with penguins <laughs> <laughs> that's I really ju- all there is to say about it <laughs> uh- and I just wanted to say that Janet Perlman is the fourth woman to be nominated in this category. Ever. Only, uh, of all time? Uh, yeah, fourth. Like, in, in, in the order. That oh, we're wow. Going. It's just like she was the oh, fourth Oh, one. okay. Th- there have been other oh, ones okay. nominated after her. Like, next year we get the fifth one, right, Diane right. Jackson. But, yeah. I, I oh, just yeah, we have, quickly we did the count. there yet. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Okay, I, well, cool. Uh, it's cute. Yeah, I also want to say, just as like a kind of a final note, that's something I realized yeah. while watching this is that the Disney version of the story actually does something really interesting with it, because like the classic version of the story is that like oh they go around with the shoe, try it on everyone, and it's like uh they the stepsisters don't fit, but then it's just like eventually they find Cinderella and she puts it on and it fits and yay, but it's just like Disney. In the Disney version, they they drop the shoe and it breaks. But then it's like Cinderella's like it's okay, but because I have the other shoe, and that is so much more interesting. Like that's such yeah. a good way to do that. Yeah, that's like a good twist because uh, because it's almost like they knew the it's like somehow in the fifties it seems like they knew the criticism of it already. It's just like well, who can't everybody be a size seven like in France and stuff like mm-hmm. that, but. Now that she has the other shoe, she it, it, there's no denying that she is the she is the one that Prince yeah. Charming met. So and, uh, pretty and cool. It also kind of combats that criticism where it's just like, why is only the one shoe the thing that remains? It's just like, yeah, it, it's just, and, and I was just I was also thinking about that, just like like maybe like in some versions they should just put in like the fairy godmother on her own just like i'm going to put all my fucking magic into making sure this fucking shoe stays a lot stays around yeah. just so <laughs> my girl can have the, her man yeah oh <laughs> her man her man uh, especially after the especially after the disaster that that happened to uh the fairy godmother in cinderella 3 a twist in time okay <laughs> <laughs> she's fucking dying <laughs> yeah she fucking dies <laughs> oh, yeah. Cinderella she th- fucking died Cinderella 3 is better Lady than Tremaine is that Lady Tremaine is that bitch mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that, that was her. a good movie uh, we, lo- we love to see a girl boss winning that's the exactly. only good Cinderella direct to video sequel because Cinderella 2 sucks sorry, sorry Cinderella 2 like has ups and downs like because it's like Cinderella 2 it's has not- it's not one thing, it's three things. It has one good segment and it's the Anastasia subplot where she meets the yeah, Anastasia the baker, baker guy. Yeah, and she meets tra- the he okay. I was pre-watching something on that. <laughs> you're gonna, you're Did gonna you watch like, that f- one fucking dumb video essay where the guy watches all of them and talks about them? Yeah, but but uh the baker in that movie, he he like fucking uh fe- like Phoebus. <laughs> huh? I-, I didn't understand. He looked it. all right. Uh he I- I'm trying to make sure I'm getting his name right because I brain fart all the time, but he he looks like he looks like Phoebus. 
uh, from Hunchback. Oh, um, I mean, me anyway, kinda. But I A think that's bit. just kind of you know like the Disney style. Like it, it just kind of looks like other guys. Yeah, I, I it, it's the hair mainly. He he has like you know the the blonde locks basically. It's like a... <laughs> Like the the baker is much more homely than Phoebus is. Like Phoebus, like he's he's kind of a dick. Like and it just in like his Phoebus style. Phoebus is a racist. <laughs> Phoebus is racist. I don't I don't stand him. <laughs> no, but Phoebus learns. He becomes anti racist. He becomes anti racist once he uh fucks a Romani woman. Okay, <laughs> he's like Romani pussy got me like. <laughs> Oh, I'm God. terrible. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. I, is, I, like, what was that one but, book that all the white people read during the pandemic that was just like, wow, what? I feel bad oh, for being white. Um, now. Fuck. Uh, it's like white guilt or something like that. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to find this. I'm going to find it because I know if I Google it, I will. I will find it. It's something like white guilt or something like that. I. Unless it's just called that. It might just be called White Guilt. But yeah, the, it's like, like Phoebus read that book and it's just like, wow, I gotta <laughs> think about something. Just White Fragility. That's what it is. White Fragility. White fragility. Yeah. Uh, he, re- he, <laughs> he was like, just found out about racism. Damn, that shit sucks. <laughs> it's just like, wow. I never realized you had it so hard. Maybe yeah. being... <laughs> Being a cop in France in th- this time period, it sucks. It's not. It's not yeah, woke. It's not woke. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he like say a slur to her or something? Like I, it's just a like, lot of people say wow. slurs in that movie. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, Quasimodo also says something like, "You're not like the others." Though. Yeah, it's... but also he. He but he was very much boy. manipulated. This thing, and he doesn't yeah, even a, say he the was slur. A sheltered boy. Yeah, like he, he doesn't say the slur. <laughs> anyway, so Hunchback uh, of Notre Dame. Quasi, Quasimodo gets his manic pixie dream girl anyway, and Hunchback of Notre Dame. God, too. don't remind me about that fucking movie. Too. <laughs> uh, it's worse than Boy Mole Fox and Horse. <laughs> but you know how bad that fucking is. <laughs> <laughs> oh god um, what, what a punchback of Notre Dame but with penguins <laughs> what, if, what if just what if we just took every Disney movie and just put penguins in them just just every Disney fairy tale just add pe- mm-hmm. just make them with penguins Snow White with penguins I, I, Pinocchio with penguins <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm trying to think like hunchback of Notre Dame except with penguins this is like I guess they would just give the penguin a slouch, and that's how he, they'd make him Quasimodo. Yeah. Like... <laughs> he's like, or, or he's like, he has some kind of like metaphorical disability, like in Happy Feet or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they play Boogie Wonderland. No, okay. <laughs> they, play, um, they play Ball in Wonderworld on the PS4. Yes. No, now I want Les Miserables, but with penguins. <laughs> <laughs> Les Miserables, but with penguins. Okay, not to veer off on the Disney thing, but I've seriously always wondered what a uh like a '90s uh Disney Les Miserables, like Disney Renaissance adaptation of Les Miserables Ooh, would have been like. That'd be interesting. <laughs> like, like, especially after uh um uh. What's it called? Um, I'm back of Notre Dame. Jeez, sorry, I'm I'm kind yeah. of distracted right now because I like, see a like if they made Lame instead of Hunchback, like what what would that be like? Because they have to trim it down like a lot. I I feel like they would they they would focus a lot more on like Marius and Cosette and stuff rather than yeah. Jean Valjean and Javert. Yeah, like maybe they even I mean, cut out the whole that. thing. Well, maybe they'd have it, but it wouldn't be as much of a focus. <laughs> And they'd have the same chemistry as like Radigan and um, what's his face in uh, in um, Great Mass Detective, where it's like, oh, this is real gay. <laughs> oh, I, I just realized it's like a 
So it's like it it's going to focus mainly on Cosette. She's our main character and then it's just like it follows everything from her point of view. And so like the Jean Valjean being prisoner 24601 comes as like a big reveal. Well, as it's like, what? You were a criminal. How? How is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And it's like, oh, what? Because, like, because, like, she sees Javert it's following him. It's like, like, why is this random cop following you? And it's just like, yeah. Hmm. Why do we keep running from this random cop? <laughs> and it's funny, too, because I, in my life is already an I want song. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the musical just beat it to the punch like maybe in a universe if the if the lamest musical didn't exist then maybe disney would have done like a lamest movie <laughs> i i'm trying that's to my think, that's like because of course like they wouldn't have like empty chairs at empty tables or anything they wouldn't have the all the schoolboys die they they no. would make them all live or maybe like yeah like, would. gavroche would die Gavros would still die, but everyone else lives. Like they, they win the revolution or whatever. Oh my god. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> now do that, but with penguins. <laughs> that with penguins. Oh man. <laughs> That's seriously what I think. They were just like, what if Cinderella but with penguins? That's literally their whole thought process. The pebble and the penguin. <laughs> Remember that. Remember that Don yeah. Blake movie. Yes. I haven't seen I it, but I just Me I just know it exists. I, I Or I'll maybe I have seen it, but I don't remember it. <laughs> uh I'll I'll just be up front here. Unfortunately, I the my only connection to it is the fucking nostalgia critic review, which I have seen. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm not gonna fault you for that at all, because I, I don't even know if it's worth knowing out like in any other context really because i don't remember it at all so, um because i just remember my great grandma had a bunch of don bluth vhs tapes at her house when she was still alive and um so that's how i watched like land before time and and um the secret of nim and uh all dogs go to heaven stuff like that but mm -hmm. there there's a lot of those that i don't remember um that i probably watched <laughs> but i was just like a dumb child thumbelina and, and like, swan lake and stuff oh god or swan princess i mean anastasia, anastasia yeah mm -hmm. i don't like anastasia sorry fans <laughs> i don't like don bluth i think he's overrated oh well there you go you just topped my unpopular opinion <laughs> <laughs> i just like um, he he like something I hate in movies is when they uh tap into just like cheap emotionality, like just do the fucking sad thing just to make you sad. And it's like, oh, this is so fucking sad. And it's just like have some real fucking story in here. Don't just like that's why I hate Kit Bull, like that fucking short film. And Don Bluth has so much of that. Including the fucking small one, his short film he made with Disney or whatever, that fucking. Oh story. yeah, the with the teeth. <laughs> yeah, the the Christmas um, one where it's just like the, the kid and the donkey or whatever. Hate it. Um. Uh, yeah. Oh, so I imagine you really don't like an American Tale because it's constantly them crossing paths but not realizing. Uh, American Tales are better. Like I think American Tale and like I still think that like. What what people consider like his best work is his best work. It's just I think it's lesser. It's like uh, I, like okay. Land Before Time and uh, Secret of Nim and American Tale. Those are all like three and a half star movies. They're good, but it's just like I don't care. And then it's just like his his mediocre stuff is awful. Like I I hate All Dogs Go to Heaven so much. <laughs> all Dogs Go to Heaven is so weird. It's that movie so freaks me out. It, it weirded me out. I was like, "What's going on?" <laughs> and then you don't like uh, you don't like sexy Burt Reynolds voice. <laughs> <laughs> I like big lipped alligator moments. <laughs> I'm so I feel so bad because as much as I hate nostalgia critic now, I will still reference big lipped alligator moments. 
Because it's such a it, useful term. It's just like when, when fucking random shit happens and it's never referenced again. Big lipped alligator moment. Big lipped I, alligator moment. I hate that. I, I still reference it, but it's useful. Damn it. Yeah, it's a, unfortunately. Um, anyway, I think I, have... I think this is, might be a good place to. Like, I, you can keep yeah. talking. It's just like, let, let's think about um, wrapping this up. Right, right. I, all I wanted to say was I have the Pebble and the Penguin logged, but I don't have a reading for it. So that's me saying I've seen it, but I don't remember anything about it. But I, um, it has Tim Curry in it. So of course it does. But also Tim, but also he, Tim he does Curry's a lot of shitty lot. animation in the nineties. He was in <laughs> Fern Gully. He was he in was in Beauty and the Beast too. Beauty and the Enchanted Christmas. He's like the best part of the of Beauty and the Beast and the Enchanted Christmas. <laughs> Because he's a gay organ. <laughs> you mean a penis? <laughs> he's a gay piano organ. You mean the pussy? Thing. <laughs> the gay organ is the pussy. His his name is Forte or Fort? I don't know. Bagger. Forte. <laughs> um, and he has another uh, gay sidekick who voice Paul Rubens. <laughs> God, of course. <laughs> it's like the flute. I, but yeah, I, um, I d- did not. Re- I don't remember a thing about that movie. Uh, uh Beauty and the Beast and the Enchanted Christmas with penguins. <laughs> Peng- Beauty and the keep... Penguin. Yeah, exactly. Except they're both penguins. Just it's just keep... like a, there's nothing beastly about him. He's just a, another fucking penguin. <laughs> He's just a but, penguin. <laughs> but she still um... acts like, oh, it's a big monster. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I'm just gonna keep doing that. I'm just gonna be like this movie, but with penguins. Crack, but with penguins. <laughs> yeah, Instead of a so... chair, it's just a penguin. Yeah, yeah. The penguin yeah, sits on a like... penguin. Yeah, and then there's a bunch, and instead of all the animals and stuff in the creation, it's uh, all it's all penguins. Oops, all penguins. Oops, all penguins. <laughs> That, that's yeah. what uh, fucking Janet Perlman's series should be called. It's just "Oops, all penguins." Oops, all penguins. Yeah, real. Um, I want if she's gonna um satirize women in prison films. There's another. Uh, I want her to do other niche genres with penguins. No, and I'm not saying that as a joke. Like, I want her to do like maybe like the Golden Age musical, but with penguins or like. You know, uh, the mm, I'm trying to think of more like silly genres like black exploitation, Ma- but penguins. Madeline. Madeline. Yeah. Pink penguins. Yeah. <laughs> it's pink flamingos, <laughs> but with penguins. But with penguins. Yeah. Pink penguins. I need that. Should we rank these? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Now okay. that we've gone through and talked about these three nominees. Let's rank them all. Madeline, start us off with your number three. Uh it's it's sorry, it's the tender tale of Cinderella Penguin, just because it's 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 a cute it's a cute penguin short. That's it. It's it, fine. My number three is also the tender tale of Cinderella Penguin. And it's fine. It's good. It's solid. It's it's Cinderella, but with penguins. It's exactly what you expect. Nothing more, nothing less. Number two. Um, so I've been flopping back and forth, but and this might surprise you, given what we were talking about. But I'm gonna put the creation here, um, Ooh. because so I was contemplating making it my number one because I like the animation style a lot. Um, but I'll get into why I chose my number one. But yeah, the it's still cool short and uh james james earl jones putting his whole jussy into uh reading that poem goes yeah, hard exactly um so i, I just want to say first that uh this was act- this is really close my number one and number two i loved them both a lot uh and they actually flipped in my ranking because they used to be like what one used to be one two used to be two and then after i watched them this time they flip just by moving up and down slightly uh and so my number two is now crack which 
you know, I love it. It is beautiful. It is has great fucking music. It is just this great fucking movie. It, but I just like their creation more, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so your number one, Madeline, is Crack. Yeah, um, I put Crack above the creation just because I the reason okay so the main reason why is because I crack surprised me where um and this isn't an issue with the creation but I got exactly what I expected when I thought about the when I when I watched the creation I was like that was what I expected it to be and it was cool um crack I guess I wasn't sure what I was getting into and I was just very surprised how much it like came around to me and how um kind of moved I was by you know the conclusion of it so um I I can totally see why uh it won the the Oscar this year and uh that dang chair with the smiley face just love that chair <laughs> love that chair but yeah uh and my number one is the creation and I think what it really just came down to like it, it's such a close race but I think James Earl Jones is what sold it for me. And it's just like mm -hmm. it, it really just the creation and the yeah. crack are both just so they both bring a lot of emotions just out of me when I watch them. But it's just that James Earl Jones and he is putting everything into this narration. And it's just it moves me more than the than crack does. And that was the deciding thing. I am just more moved when I watch when I watch the creation. It is like yeah, like we said, he could probably be a good cult leader. <laughs> exactly. He, he, I will follow him wherever he goes. Exactly. Even watching that shitty live action, like quote unquote live action Lion King movie. <laughs> yeah. You, you fell for it. You uh, fell for their trick. I did. I sure did. Unfortunately. Uh, or, or, oh my God. The other 2019 disaster he was in, because he was he was a voice, he was the voice of Darth Vader in uh, Rise of Skywalker. Um, yeah. Oh, about that. This hurts. Repressed that movie. <laughs> yeah, I I'm depressed now. Damn, I still love James Earl Jones though. Yeah, he cool. he, he's a great actor. He's done a lot of good stuff. What, yeah, I love him. What he's really great in, uh, is. The fucking Shelley Duvall fairy tale theater episode, Aladdin and His Wonderful La Lamp. Uh, Whoa. He, he plays the genie and he is amazing. <laughs> that sounds incredible. I and, will look out for that. <laughs> and also, um, like, that is a genuine recognition. I think he is really great in that. But in a more like serious film, uh, Claudine is really great. He, oh, like, okay. him and Diane Carroll are just so amazing in that movie. And it's on Criterion. It's great. Everybody should buy Criterion and watch it and love it because it's amazing. Of course. Of course. Um, oh, um, I just wanted to mention to you really quickly. Um, I uh, I was just reminded because we were talking about James Earl Jones. Um, so I don't know if I told you this. Um, every time I go on Star Tours at Disneyland, I'm always cursed with getting the scenario with Naboo where you go to the Gungan City mm -hmm. and guess fucking what I went like a couple weeks ago and I got the fucking Gungan City again and it's pissing me off because there's like a billion scenarios you could do I think there's <laughs> I like six the same one. <laughs> but yeah well I mean it can mix and match like a bunch like it can mix and match them and I always get the same shit and I'm just like fuck tell me I don't want to get Naboo so okay maybe just don't ride Star Tours it's not that good I, I was kind of too I, it was for a friend's birthday but I would <laughs> love to watch Claudine um because that's been on my list for let's a long just time. get rid of Star Tours and make Claudine Tours <laughs> Claudine tours <laughs> coming to Disneyland next year <laughs> with Diane Carroll, James Earl Jones, and Lawrence Hilton Jacobs. 
<laughs> this sounds fun, actually. I, I now I want this to happen. Claudine and uh and uh let's do a Claudine and a Cooley High crossover for Star Tours. <laughs> and, and then we also have uh the Great White Hope submarine voyage. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, correct. <laughs> and then um... also 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 that. But with penguins. <laughs> Star Tours. But with penguins. Star Tours with penguins. Well, they have the I'm fucking... Gonna, I, I, oh, God. I think <laughs> people have had enough of me saying with penguins. <laughs> okay. For our, our new Disneyland, but it's all James Earl Jones. Coming to America Sings. Yes. <laughs> but with penguins, of course. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, of course. All right. I I but... think uh, that this is... We're, we're, we're wrapping things up here. But before we end our yeah. show, are there any final thoughts you'd like to share, Madeline, or anything you'd like to promote? Uh, just my letterbox. That's the only thing I'm on because I deactivated my Twitter because it's a cesspool. So um, I'm at that odd chica on Letterbox. If you want to follow me, <laughs> all right. I I hope you do follow her. Uh, though I I guess you won't be alerted when this episode goes up because we just kind of post on Twitter. It's okay. I'll, I'll make sure to send it to you. Oh yeah. So well, can... I follow on Spotify too. Oh okay. Well yeah yeah well well thank you Madeline for coming on the show. And thank you, thank listener, you. for tuning in. This has been the short podcast about short films. Until next time, goodbye.